Well, let's look forward to that day that uh, all these restrictions are lifted and things are back to the new normal um, and you're able to sit down and have coffee with a friend. And let's say that you sit down and you have coffee uh, with, with a butterfly. Um, you guys are catching up on how things are going, and at some point, uh, the butterfly just kind of leans forward and, and says, look, I'm just really struggling. I, I just don't think I can handle the pressure of being a butterfly anymore. Um, it's just tough. I, you know, I've got to keep up a certain appearance. It just kind of gets tiring to fly all the time, and you know, I've got to watch out for birds and things like that. And it was just so much easier when I could just be a caterpillar. Um, my bed and my dinner were the same thing. Uh, I, I could just kind of hang out, eat when I wanted to, sleep when I wanted to, just relax, and just literally just kind of hang around. Um, I think I want to go back to being a caterpillar. I think after you heard that, you would probably put down your coffee and say, you have got to be out of your mind. What in the world is wrong with you? Look at you. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. Caterpillars are not. You can fly. It's incredible what you can do. Why would you want to go back to being a caterpillar? It's a crazy conversation. Um, but it's a conversation that I think will be helpful if you kind of keep it in the back of your mind as we go through today's passage. Because what Paul is going to do is he's going to talk about the temptation that we face to go back to a life that is no longer ours and the significance of that. And he's gonna talk about it in terms that are very similar to a butterfly saying, I wanna go back to being a caterpillar. Well, let's just reset where we are. Um, and again, we are in Romans, but what I want you to know is we're actually starting a whole new section. Uh, we've been talking about in this part of Romans that God gives righteousness to us, and now we're transitioning to how that righteousness that he gives us is going to affect us. And um, last week, we kind of started transitioning into that, but here this transition, we're, we're kind of going full steam. I also bring up last week because... Um, it was a very dense passage, and we're actually, in this whole section, it is going to be very dense. And so each week, we're going to try to be really careful to slow down and, and, and carefully see what God is saying to us through his passage and then apply it. Now, last week, remember that we talked about the fact that um, Jesus overturns all of the damage that was done by Adam. Uh, and we saw that God's grace abounds in the face of sin. And in fact, the passage talked about the more sin increases, grace abounds all the more. Well, that's helpful to remember because what Paul is going to do here is pick up a natural question that might occur to someone after making a statement like that. Um, and what we're going to see is that Paul is going to address why that truth doesn't just open the door for us to sin. And he's going to lay it out in uh, a couple of different, um, really uh, kind of a progression through the truth that we are um, dead to sin, we are united with Christ, and because we're dead to sin and united with Christ, we are now freed from sin. So really he's going to focus on the fact that because we're united with Christ, we are freed from sin. It's just going back to a life of sin makes about as much sense as a butterfly going back to being a caterpillar. So let's start. We are in Romans chapter six. We are in, starting in verse one. And the first section, as I said, really has to do with the fact that we are dead to sin. And uh, we see that in verses one through four. So let's take a quick start uh, with verses one and two where he sets out kind of the theme of this whole passage. What shall we say then? And this is pointing back to chapter five where, where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now, if you stop and think about it, just on his face, this is just 
kind of a weird question. It's it's like you're you're cheating gr- grace like it's a it, it it's a commodity or or like it's well let's make this really good like it's apple pie, and, and the goal is to just get more and more of it, and that's a good goal with apple pie. Um, but Paul is kind of saying that's really not the right, right way of thinking about grace. Grace isn't like something you just get and try to accumulate more and more of. The goal of grace is to change us. We don't try to collect it like it's toilet paper. But if you stop and think about this question a different way, the question may not sound so strange to us. What if you were to ask the question this way? Isn't the good that comes from sin worth it? I think that's a form of the question that, that I can struggle with and you can struggle with. We, we can justify sin in our lives because we think the benefit to us or the benefit to someone else is worth it. And so think of the question that way, and that's kind of what Paul is saying. Is, is the question is, is the, is the benefit of sin worth the sin? And Paul in verse 2 gives this incredibly emphatic negative. He says, by no means... Is it worth it? And, and he's, he argues that, that there is not a chance that we can understand the benefit from sin to being worth it. So it's interesting because think about how you would make that argument if you were going to, to press that point. right? Think about how most sermons make that argument or Bible studies or, or Sunday school lessons that we've heard. You get a cost-benefit analysis. You get this analysis that says... If you do this sin, the consequences are going to be so bad that um, it's just not going to be worth the benefit. Or you'll hear the flip side. If you don't do this sin, the benefit is so much greater than doing the sin, it's, it's just not worth it to do the sin. That's fine. But that's not what Paul does here. And I want you to see that. Because sometimes if we just rely on kind of a cost benefit analysis of why we sin, we convince ourselves that the sin really is worth it. And so Paul is going deeper than that. He's going to say that we don't sin not because of the consequences of sin, but because of who we are. And so he says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? You see, us going back to sin, us living a life of sin, giving in to sin, is just like that butterfly saying, I want to be a caterpillar. And it's not about a cost-benefit analysis. It's about that's not who you are. You don't need to live as a caterpillar because you're a butterfly. Now, Paul's going to develop this thought even more in verses 3 through 5. Do, uh, 3 through 4, excuse me. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Well, let me clear something up real quick. He's not saying when he talks about baptism here that baptism is what saves us. That's, that's not his point here. He's using baptism to point out that it is a physical picture of what is true of us spiritually. When we, are, we go under the water, it is a picture of us dying and being buried. And when we come out of the water, it is a picture of us being raised with Christ. And, and so Paul's point in these verses is that through Christ's death and resurrection, we have died to sin and, and we are new people. We have a newness of life. And so sinning is really going back to the old person that has died. Now, throughout this passage, I, I have created some charts to try to help us really track what's going on with Paul. And I think it will be helpful for us here to kind of stop and, and just think about what is Paul representing about who we were before Christ. And, and Paul is saying that, that sort of at the core of who we are is, is a sinful self. 
And that sinful self is, is kind of like a weed that, that reaches out into all of the parts of us, into our emotions and values, and into our will, into our thinking, and, and into the physical parts of us. It's all kind of infested with sin, and, um, and it's not possible to break free from that. Well, that kind of continues to work its way out in our life. And so if you think about the fact that um, everything is centered on self, then we look to ourself to protect ourself, to provide for ourself, and we promote our own agendas. And, and so self is all about how we get our well-being. We protect ourselves, we promote ourselves, we provide for ourselves, and we're doing that, you know, through physical provision and protection. We're doing that emotionally in our relationships and so forth. And so this is how it plays out. Ultimately, we look at the things around us. Our friends are really just um, objects that we use to provide for, to protect, and promote ourselves. Certainly money is that way. Um, authorities in our life, enemies in our life, our work. And you can put so many other things that are not included here. But everything in our lives is fundamentally kind of sucked back into towards ourselves to promote ourselves, protect ourselves, or to, to provide for ourselves emotionally, physically, or in other ways. So that's the picture that Paul has here. And, and the core of sin is really the deep self-absorption. And that's what Paul's talking about has been on the throne and controlling our lives. And it's been weeding out through the different parts of us into all of our relationships. Well, Paul is going to try to change this picture and say, this is not how we need to be. This is not how we need to relate to the world around us. In fact, once we come to Christ, we are very different. And the reason that we are different is because we are united with Christ. And he's going to show two different ways in verses 5 through 11 for how it is that we are united with Christ. We are united with Christ first in his death, and then we are united with Christ in his resurrection. So first he talks about we are united with Christ in his death. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. One of the um, home projects that Anne has put me on uh, while I've been here, his, or while we've been in quarantine, is um, taking down some trees. And here's the thing about the trees specifically that she wanted to go. These aren't big trees. I wasn't pulling out a chainsaw. Uh, you would not want to trust me with a chainsaw. Um, but what I've been doing is, is going after some smaller trees that had grown kind of out of place. They'd grown up in clumps with other trees, and, and they were so close to those other trees that when you looked at them, it looked like they were grafted together. It looks like they were all kind of one tree, but, but really it was just one tree that was kind of what we call a junk tree was sucking the life out of the tree that we wanted to be there. So, so we needed to remove that junk tree. And, and in one case, these trees were so closely intertwined that Ann and I were working on this together. We were both looking at the tree and we were both figuring out where to cut and we actually cut down the wrong tree. Well, the reason I'm talking about trees is because that picture of, of two trees that were so close together that they look like they are one is actually the very picture that's behind the word that's translated united in this passage. That's often how it was used. It was used of looking into a very thick forest and seeing trees that were so close together that even though they were different trees, they were completely distinct, you looked at them, they looked as if they were one single tree. And that's what Paul pictures here when he says we have been united with Christ in a death that's like his. It's, it's not that, that, that our coming to Christ and his death were the same event. It's, it's that they are so closely connected, it's almost as if you can't separate them. 
Our sinful self was crucified with Jesus. And the purpose of that, we know that our old self was crucified. The purpose of that, in order that, the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that inner core that's like a weed has, has been, um, that, that has been infecting all the different parts of us, the mind and the will and the, the emotions and values and the physical, all of that has been put to death so it doesn't have that influence. And then the result so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That inner core, that self-centered inner core has been put to death so that we're no longer enslaved by sin. So let's go back to the chart and see what that looks like. So it looks the same in every sense, except for that inner core has now been put to death. And so it's, it's kind of like putting Roundup on that uh, sinful self so it begins to kill all of the little influences that are going out and affecting the different parts of us. Now you look at that and say, okay, but why do we still struggle with sin? I mean, if that's true, why do we still have this issue? Well, because we still have this orange ring here that has a lot of practice at operating on a self-focus. And so we still have a lot of work to do, or there's a lot of work to be done, on, on changing that ring so we're not operating out of self, even though that, self, uh, that self-centeredness has been killed. And that's what Paul starts to get into in the next section when he talks about our, un- our unity with Christ isn't just in his death, but it's in his resurrection. And that picks up in verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he lived to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, we are united with Christ in his resurrection And that replaces the sinful self that was at the core of us with a new life. So verse 8 is saying we don't stop with dying with Christ, that we also know that we will live with him. Now, I want you to catch the fact that here he's talking in future tense. So so he's talking about the life that is ahead of us in in eternity. And it's the promise that, that physical death and spiritual separation from God will not have the final word. There is life that is ahead of us. Now, he's going to broaden that by the end of this paragraph, but he starts by focusing on the life that is in front of us in our future. Now, verse 9 shows that death no longer has any power over Jesus at all. Death can never come back and reclaim Jesus. It says, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death has no further claim, and death no longer can have dominion or control over him. And that is so important because if death were able to come back and reclaim Jesus or have dominion over Jesus, then it would have potentially dominion over us. What is our protection? And so Paul assures us that this has been, that Jesus' victory is final and complete. And he explains that more in verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin. Now remember, Jesus never sinned, so what's he talking about there? He's talking about the once for all, complete, final victory that Jesus had over sin. His sacrifice was the final and climactic sacrifice that's required. And there are two results for that. One is that it is complete. It is once for all. There are no more sacrifices that are necessary. But the second result is the life that is available because he lives for God. He has opened the door to life with God for all of us. And then verse 7 summarizes really all of verses 5 through 10. And it is the first command that we find in this passage. We are to consider. And the word consider is, is really just a word that means to think hard. It's to think in depth about. But it's not just once because it also has the idea of continually regularly thinking about something. 
And what is it that we're supposed to think about? We're supposed to think about what's true of us. We're supposed to think about the fact that we are dead to sin, that that old sinful self that was at our core has been, has been killed, and now it's been replaced by something new, that we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. And did you catch how he says this at the end? That we are alive right now, present tense. So what Christ gives us, because we are in him, is not just life for the future. It is life right now, new life in him right now. So let's go back to our chart again. Now the chart has changed. It's no longer that sinful self that's in the core. It is life in Christ. And it is life in Christ that works itself into our will and our thinking, into our even our bodies and our emotions and our values. And, and we now start to have a, a life that looks like Christ, that thinks like Christ, that wants what Christ wants and value, values what Christ values and, and behaves the way that Christ behaves. This is why we're supposed to regularly think hard about the fact that we have new life in Christ, that it's changing us in each of these areas. And, and we're also to be thinking about the fact that, that Christ is constantly at work in changing us. That's why I regularly ask the question, and you may get tired of hearing it, but I regularly ask the question, what is God doing in your life? How have you seen God at work? And I notice that very often we have a hard time answering that question. But I want to challenge you to make that question a regular part of your daily routine or some version of that. Because what you're actually doing when you ask that question or answer that question, the reason I constantly ask it is because I want to help you consider the truth that we're seeing in this passage. I want you to consider the fact that Christ is at work and he is transforming every part of you. And he is at work every single moment of every single day. And the more that we pay attention to that and understand that, the more we are in fact considering what Christ has done in killing off the sinful self and replacing it with new life. Now, Paul wraps up the passage with three more commands, and so we're going to look at each of those commands to finish off. Starting in verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. See, the first command is basically do not allow, do not let sin to reign in your mortal body. So what does that mean? It means that killing sin, killing the sinful self, doesn't mean that we aren't tempted to sin, right? It means that you are now able to resist that temptation, but the reality is there's a part of you, there's a part of you that's still subject to physical death, for example, that, that is going to be used by sin to tempt you into putting sin back on the throne. And I don't know if you caught it, but, but Paul is actually using a word picture here. He's, he's trying to get us to picture something. He's trying to get us to picture a king who has been dethroned, that sinful self, and yet that king is trying to get back onto the throne. And the implication is the only reason we sin, or the main reason that we sin, is because we allow that dethroned king to get back on the throne. Well, Paul's actually going to continue that image in the next two uh, commands, which are both in verse 13. The first command is to do not present, or some of your translations say do not offer, your members, what is he talking about there? Well, he's talking about the will, the emotions and values. He's talking about the body. He's talking about your thinking. Do not offer those parts of yourselves as instruments. Probably the best translation for instruments is weapons. The idea is do not take those parts of your life and offer them to the dethroned king, to sin, 
as weapons to use in its attempt to gain back the throne. That's what it's saying. So it's kind of like a a king's loyal subject offering himself to be used as the king's soldier in battle. And, And this is you saying to sin, who wants to get back into the throne, use me for your purposes to get back on the throne. Well, the rest of verse 13 contrasts that directly with the other command. It says, instead of not presenting, we are to present. We're to present ourselves to God as, again, it's those members that he's talking about, so it's those parts of us, um, and we are to present ourselves, again, same word, instruments, as weapons or even tools for God to use in establishing righteousness. So let's go back to the chart real quick and take a look at um, what it is that, that Paul is saying kind of in a graphic way. Paul is saying that because we have life in Christ, we now have the ability to take every parts of our lives and we present them to God and say, take each part of those and you use them as you will use them. Use them for righteousness. Use them for your purposes. Now, stop and think about this for a second. How does a king relate to a subject? Well, when a subject puts himself under the control of a king, that subject is saying, I trust you to provide for me, to protect me, and I commit to you to promote your agenda. Well, and that's exactly the picture that we had before Christ, right? When self was at the center, we trusted self to provide for us, we trusted self to protect us, and we promoted our own agenda. But now Paul's changing the picture. And he's saying, no, now that you are, you you need to present yourself as the weapons, as soldiers, as tools, as a subject to God for him to be king and throne. And so now you're looking at God for protection and provision, and you're promoting his agenda. And so that radically changes. The life of Christ starts working its way outward. And so now you're thinking of how do I work God's agenda in how I use my time? How do I support God's agenda in my relationship with my friends, in my relationships with my enemies, in my relationships with finances, and how I spend my money? Now it's a totally different way of thinking. Instead of the arrows coming in and being self-focused, the arrows of our lives, we are looking out, we are pointing out, we are asking, how do we allow our lives to be used by God for his purposes? for righteousness. It changes everything. Now, this is a passage that has been extremely rich in theology, but I want to make sure that we make it very practical. So what are we supposed to do in response to this passage? How do we live out the fact that we are, that we are dead to sin, and at the same time, we are alive to God in Christ? Well, I think the answer to that is actually in the four commands that we found in this passage. Right? Remember, consider, do not let sin reign, do not present yourself to sin, and present yourself to God. So considering, how do we consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God? I think we make it our daily practice to return to the truth that you are dead to sin and alive to God. You are a butterfly. You're not a caterpillar. And and the way that I'm going to do that this week is I'm going to try to memorize these uh, verses that have these commands. So verses 11 through 14. And I want to memorize them and I want to keep coming back to them again and again as a way of resetting my mind. Who am I? I am dead to sin. I'm alive to Christ. And because of that, that has consequences in my life. But I've got to start with the right understanding of who I am and let that truth really penetrate deep into my soul and to start to change that that orange ring from self-protection, self-promotion, and and self-provision to trusting God for those things so that my life can be focused outward. Do not let sin reign. That was in uh, verse 12. How do we do that? Well, that means we can't be passive when we face temptation. And so you see, for example, one of the values of memorizing scripture is when temptation comes to our life, we, we go against that with the truth of scripture. Like a very practical thing that we do when we find ourselves faced with temptation or heading down that path is first immediately 
resist that temptation by going to the Lord in prayer and saying, I do not want to live as if I am, as if I am uh, still controlled by that sinful self. And I want to live as someone who is alive in you. And then we go to the truth of Scripture, which if you haven't memorized, can be right at the tip of your tongue to be able to say, this is what is true. And very often, depending on the temptation, we need to do a lot more than that. But I think this is part of what it means to not present ourselves um, for sin to reign within us, is we need to fight that temptation. Third, we need to, um, or to not let sin reign. I'm sorry. Third, we need to not let sin uh, not present ourselves to sin. And, and so I think this means to, to not go looking for sin, right? And, and sometimes this is the huge mistake that we make. We put ourselves in positions where we know we are going to give in to temptation. And, and we just need to not put ourselves in those positions. But I also think it's more than that. I think it's what we do with our mind uh, in how we think and what we dwell on. And so often what we think about and dwell on, especially when our mind is at rest, sets us up for giving in to sin later. It's like we're, we're presenting our mind to, uh, to, to sin and saying, use me when you have the chance. Finally, present yourselves to God. This is proactive. Sin is, sin is almost always about promoting my own agenda or protecting self or providing for self. And presenting yourself to God means just flipping that around. It's, it's asking God to use any and every part of you for his agenda, to be a part of his provision and protection in the lives of the people around you, to promote his agenda in the lives of people around you and in the resources that you've been given. It's to proactively seek the Lord, seek scripture, seek wise counsel for how you can do that in the lives of people around you. Let me give you an example from my life that it's been a helpful example for me to turn back to over the years. This, this actually happened long before I lived in, uh, in Longview, but it was such a, a powerful moment in my life. I keep coming back to it. I used to work with someone who was... Um, uh, let me put it this way. She looked almost exactly like the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz. Um... I kept looking for flying monkeys every time I was around her. And she kind of acted that way. She was tough. She was tough for everyone to deal with. And at some point, I just became really convicted. And this is, I think, the consider part of the whole thing. I became really convicted that, that how I was responding to her it wasn't just that I was avoiding her. That was certainly true. I was also gossiping behind her back. I was complaining to other people about her. I, I, was, I was doing things that were not consistent with someone who considered themselves to be dead to sin and alive, in, alive to God in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit convicted me of that every time that I did it. And I just had to go to the Holy Spirit in prayer in prayer and say to change me, change my response to her. Then I needed to not let sin reign. And so what I had to do was decide ahead of time that I was not going to give, in the ten, give into the temptation to gossip or to complain about her. And so if a conversation with some coworkers started down that direction, I, I, I would try to get out of that conversation or, or turn the conversation I'm going to be honest, very often I was the one who would start those conversations of gossip or complaint, and, um, and I just I needed the Holy Spirit to help catch me. So in those moments, as I'm starting down that path, I would catch myself and, and try to turn the conversation a different way. And so that was for me trying not to allow sin to reign in my life. I needed to not present myself to sin, and, and for me, that really had a lot to do with my thought life. Um, when she was cruel or to me or to someone else, I, I needed to stop thinking about ways that I wanted to get back with her. Honestly, the biggest one, uh, and you probably know how this goes, is she says something or does something that's just mean-spirited. And you walk away and you sit down and you spend the next 30 minutes thinking through all of the things that you wish you could say. 
all the things you wish you had said, had said, all the ways that you want to put this person in their place. And, and I needed to stop doing that. I needed to stop wishing that she would just get fired. That was just not healthy, productive uh, ways of thinking. It was actually me presenting myself to be used as unrighteousness, kind of, kind of saying, if I get the chance, this is what I want to do. Instead, what I needed to do is present myself to God for his use in righteousness. I needed to take up God's agenda for her. And so literally every day for the rest of uh, the time that I worked there, every day I walked into that office, I came in with a plan. And that plan was going to be, how do I show in a practical way that God loves her? And I would be very willing and very open and did often to talk about spiritual issues. And a lot of it was just me talking about what's going on in my life. You know, be, hey, how was your weekend? And, and she would answer and she would uh, ask me how my weekend was. And I said, yeah, it was a great weekend. Did this on Saturday, on Sunday, went to church, had a really good time with my, fo- you know, my friends there and, and so forth. And, and just, just naturally sprinkling, this is the reality of my life. This is who I am. This is what Christ is doing in me. Now, I'm not gonna tell you the rest of the story. And the reason I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story is because I want to resist the temptation to do what Paul does not do here. Paul does not enter into a cost-benefit analysis. The point isn't what happened in my relationship with that person. The point isn't what happened in her life. Those are wonderful blessings. The point Paul is making in this passage is you do those things. You consider, you don't let sin reign, you don't present yourself to sin, and you present yourself to God, not because of the benefits that come out of it, but because this is who you are as a follower of Christ. And I will tell you that once I flipped that switch and started relating to her in a different way, there was, in fact, the freedom and the peace and even the confidence that came from being who I was designed to be with that person that had nothing to do with her response. It was just, this is how God built me to be. And so I'm going to step into that and be that person. And that is what Paul is calling uh, for us to do in this passage. He has reminded us that you are dead and alive at the same time. The part of you that was completely under sin's control, the part of you that could never, ever say no to sin has has been killed. It has been buried. And that is because you are united with Christ in his death. And that has been replaced with new life New life that waits for you in the future, but new life also that you enjoy and can live out today because you are united with Christ in his resurrection. And that means that you can have new life that finds provision, protection, and promoting the agenda of God in God. And it also means that you can uh, provide provision, protection, and promote God's agenda into the lives of others. He is growing that new life in you and your job is to join him in that process by not allowing the old self to be back in control. And that's the point of the passage that Paul is writing. Union with Christ frees us from the power of sin. And the implication of that in our lives is that we can dethrone the sin that is controlling us. Well, just a couple of thoughts that will allow us to resist the temptation to going back to being a caterpillar when we are a butterfly. A couple of, of exercises that, that, or disciplines that might help us. One is, wow, if ever there was a passage that you want to rewrite, even if you haven't been rewriting uh, Romans up to this point, rewrite this passage because it is so powerful to spend time thinking about the truths. And it's exactly what Paul commands us to do. Spend time thinking about the truths that are in this passage. Uh, we can't do these things on our own power, right? This is not about behavior modification. This is not about think the right way and you'll do the right things. We have to rely always on the power of the Holy Spirit to 
take the truths that we are considering and drive them deeper into our lives so that they work themselves out in our, in our will and thinking and in our emotions and values and, and in our physical relationships. And, and we need to work them out into um, the world around us. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. So we have to pray. And so I'm challenging you to ask the Holy Spirit to deepen your grasp that you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Memorize, join me in memorizing Romans 6, 11 through 14, that you can have that to come back to, especially as temptation uh, comes into your life. So you can say, I am not going to put that sin back on the throne. I'm not going to let that sin reign. Uh, pick one sin that you do have a tendency to allow to reign in your life, that you do have a tendency to put back on the throne. And and decide now, ahead of time. It's what I had to do with this co-worker. Decide ahead of time what you're going to do when that temptation comes. How are you going to respond in prayer? What passages or what will, what will you go to in Scripture? Is there a friend that you need to call to say, pray with me right now or help me or, or something else that you need to do? Um, and then finally, ask the Lord to use you for his agenda this week. And really, that's something we just need to keep doing but, but Paul is saying we can't just stop at resisting sin. We have to present ourselves as weapons for God to use in his agenda of bringing righteousness. This is a dense, tough passage, but this is a passage that will give you life as the truth of it really sinks deeply in. Will you join me in prayer now praying for the Holy Spirit to do that for each one of us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have taken that old sinful self and you have united it with Christ in his death and you have buried it. But Lord, you didn't stop there. You didn't just leave this void in our lives. You united us with Christ in his resurrection and because of that, we have new life. We have new life in our future and eternity, but we are made alive today. And Lord, we ask for your help because we need to take this truth and it needs to control us more and it needs to seep through every area of our lives and it needs to seep into all of our relationships and, and how we use all of our resources. And Lord, there is just so much against us operating that way in the world. So we ask for your help in, in just really anchoring those truths into our lives. And we thank you that you do seek to use us as your tools, as your weapons to further your agenda of righteousness. Use us this week. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So here's what the passage has said about God. It has said that God has given you new life in Christ. So what is your challenge? Your challenge is to internalize that truth a little more every day and to live out that truth a little more every day. I look forward to getting together in person. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness and being a part of these online services. That is a real blessing, uh, but it's going to be an even greater blessing to see you face to face. And I look forward